Good evening and welcome to the latest IOP Speaker Series event, Countering China's Economic Power, Can the U.S. Finally Catch Up? My name is Anna Lucia Mihilson. I am a first year in the college hoping to major in molecular engineering, and I am an events ambassador with the Institute of Politics. Before I highlight our guests today, I wanted to briefly mention a few upcoming IOP events. On Thursday, January 26th, the Speaker Series will host its latest pop-up, this time featuring former IOP Pritzker Fellow Laura Dove and Washington Post reporter Paul Kane exploring what's ahead for the new Congress. That event will take place at the IOP House at 12 p.m. Then on February 2nd, Chicago style, the student-led IOP event committee will be in conversation with Alderman Leslie Hairston about the upcoming mayoral and aldermanic races. That event will take place at 3 p.m. at the IOP House. And now on to today's event, which will feature our three incredible panelists. First, we have Margaret Lewis, a law professor at Seton Hall University whose research centers on criminal justice and human rights in the Chinese and Taiwanese legal systems. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a former Fulbright senior scholar, and a public intellectuals program fellow for the National Committee on United States-China Relations. She has published work in a number of academic journals and is co-author of Challenge to China, How Taiwan Abolished Its Version of Reeducation Through Labor. Next, Damian Ma is the managing director and co-founder of Macro Polo, a think tank within the Paulson Institute dedicated to promoting a U.S.-China relationship that benefits the global order. In addition to publishing pieces across the New York Times, The Atlantic, Foreign Affairs, and Bloomberg, and writing and editing several books, he is also adjunct faculty at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. Lastly, Tim Ryan was a Democratic nominee in the contested race for the Ohio Senate seat in 2022 and a presidential candidate in 2020. He served as an Ohio representative in Congress from 2003 to 2023 and introduced legislation such as the Currency Reform for Fair Trade Act. Most recently, he chaired the subcommittee on the legislative branch tasked with investigating the storming of the U.S. Capitol. Here to lead us in con conversation is Craig Kafura, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs' Assistant Director for Public Opinion and Foreign Policy. He is involved in a wide variety of research through the Council and has published writing across sources such as the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, and The Diplomat. He is also a security fellow with the Truman National Security Project. As usual, please silence your phones. We will be taking questions at the end with priority given to students. Now please welcome our panelists. Thank you all for joining us uh, here tonight, either in person or virtually online. Uh, I am very, very excited to be able to moderate this panel today because I have a lot of questions about US-China trade and I'm hoping <laughs> our three panelists can give us some answers or at least ask us some good questions. So the framing for this event was that the US is finally catching up to China. Where is the US playing catch up and how far behind are we? Congressman, do you wanna kick us off? Uh, yeah, sure, thank you. I appreciate everybody being here. Hello, everybody. Great to be in Chicago. Weather and all, it's beautiful here. <laughs> Never thought like Youngstown, Ohio would be warm, but it is compared to this. Um, and I just, just briefly, like uh, um, here as a fellow for a couple days um, to the Institute and just wanna kind of share publicly how, how impressed um, I've been over the last 24 hours plus with the, the caliber of young people that are coming through this Institute. Um, I just, you know, you, you come off of a political campaign and, and, you know, there's lots of opinions about things in the world. And I am just have gained a, a lot of inspiration from the young people here, knowing that there's so many good people that want to go out into the world and make a big difference. So I just wanted to, to, to say that um, I have I sat on the um, Appropriations Committee and the Defense Appropriations Committee um, for a good deal of time and the the relationship um, of that committee in preparing us for being able to outcompete China, you know, watching over the last 20 years, um, China build islands in the South China Sea, have a really comprehensive approach on, on how they're trying to project power in Asia and then eventually around the world. The Belt Road Initiative where they've had a, uh, a very robust effort to on infrastructure, oil and gas, um, bases in Africa to protect their, um, their natural resource and their investments into rare earth metals and everything else into the African continent, like a really comprehensive plan. And so I've been concerned with, you know, you some of this is classified that I won't mention, but hypersonics 
their, their move into some technologies that have leapfrogged the United States, this coordinated effort that they've had, and then looking at the United States, you know, where you're trying to outcompete a country that has a hundred year plan, um, and we are trapped in a insane 24 hour news cycle here, you know? And so my, my whole idea has been like, they have a plan now, the plan's running some hiccups in the last few months that we can certainly talk about, but they had this comprehensive plan and the United States had no industrial policy, um, no, you know, uh, until recently, no real plan. And that has been my concern. And one, one really good example is the, the issue around hypersonics. Damien, I feel like you've got some thoughts on the well, I'll just I briefly uh, piggyback off of Congressman Ryan's comments. I'm, I don't, I'm not privy to the classified documents. I haven't been in government, so I won't speak on the military side, but from where I sit in the private sector and in, 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 think, in think tank space, uh, where I see competition predominantly between U.S. and China is in the economic realm, probably less so than in the military realm, relative to, say, uh, you know, the Cold War that we had with the Soviet Union, which was much more militaristic. Uh, because the spending was, you know, there was an arms race, there was a lot of things focused on, on, on the military. And of course, I think the obvious point is simply that the Soviet Union, even at, at its height, just wasn't as a formidable economic force as China is. Uh, you know, China slowed down, but 2022 uh, GDP just came out, they're $18 trillion now. Uh, that's about 70, 72% of the US GDP. So they haven't caught up, but I would say I think we're looking at, uh, you know, China, China has made pretty significant strides in terms of closing that gap just in pure aggregate terms. So from where I sit, I see the competition much more across the economic dimensions, whether it's technology or supply chains, some of which will absolutely have dual applications mm -hmm. to the military. And do you think it's the case that the U.S. has fallen behind China in some of those areas? Are there areas where China has leapfrogged the U.S. in the economic realm? Or is the U.S. still broadly ahead? Well, we, we can get into the details. I'll just say a very quick point. I think we're not, we're not behind in, in, in any technical serious sense. Uh, U.S. absolutely leads on frontier technology, leads in R&D. I think where we might be lagging a little bit now is uh, in sort of deploying the present, as I would like to call it, is we're not really uh, uh, you know, deploying the technologies of today um, as, as rapidly as China has been doing, whether it's you know, clean energy technologies or, 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 or it is you know, uh, EVs, uh, which is a big sector, those things are happening now. So we're far ahead on the frontier and the leading edge. But I, but I think in terms of what we, what we need today, uh, China, I think right now does a better job and I wouldn't frame it as catching up, but they do a better job at deploying a lot of that in their country than we do here. And so it seems like there's some areas now where the, the U.S. is clearly seeing China trying to catch up and trying to put a stop to that. Uh, the recent efforts on semiconductors clearly seem like an attempt to really kneecap Chinese industries. Uh, I think the phrase that I always used to see on this was people hoping for a small yard with a high fence. Now, do you want to explain what that means and if we've gotten there or if we've gone maybe with a slightly bigger yard? Right. No, first, thank you to IOP for hosting and, and happy Year of the Rabbit to anyone who is celebrating Lunar New Year. Uh, and may it be a kind year and not as fierce as the tiger for the world. But, uh, but I, I'm a, a criminal justice, a human rights person. I'm not an economist, so I'll, I'll leave the numbers to, to Damien. But what I'm worried about is, is what's happening that how does the United States retain attract and develop talent because yes, we have great R&D today in the United States, but what is it gonna be in 10 years or 20 years? And you need that pipeline. And, and certainly a lot of that is homegrown talent. And I say that as a parent of a seven and 10 year old who were kind of past the volcano with baking soda and vinegar stage, you know, but still like I, you know, I see STEM obviously developing here, but the United States, you look, we have developed so well in R&D because of talent from abroad. And so unfortunately, I think that we've seen really in the last five years, but even longer, a lot of concerns about how people who have ties to China, um, just, you know, not even recent ties are being treated. And there's a real chilling effect that is affecting our competitiveness. One point on semiconductors is someone who spends a lot of time in Taiwan. It used to be, I'd say TSMC and most people in the U.S. would have no idea what I was talking about. And suddenly it's like, 
this is something that people know because semiconductors are so important and, and the realization amongst people who don't work in the tech space that are, they're so important. So there I'm really happy to see in the United States that TSMC is building fabs, that we're also seeing other big companies that are coming over with technology and onshoring it here. At the same time, as someone who cares dearly about Taiwan, I want Taiwan's semiconductor industry to flourish. And of course, they have not the big chunky chips, but the really tiny fancy chips and to make sure that the IP is, is secure is a big concern as well. You put a lot on the table there. I'm going to try to get through it all in the next hour. <laughs> Let's stick with talent for right now. We're at a university. We have plenty of international students here at the University of Chicago and all around Chicago. A lot of them would like to stay in the United States after graduation, and we might not make that very easy. Congressman, how can we better retain the talent that we're already attracting to the U.S.? Yeah, I, mean, I think make, facilitate staying, I, mean, I think, is really important. Um, we have always benefited from immigration, and I think as we're moving into the, the new economy of electric vehicles, batteries, all the research that needs to be done around you know, hydrogen and all, you know, carbon capture, all of this stuff, like we need the best and the brightest here in the United States. That's always been our comparative advantage. And so making that easier where you come here, you got a PhD here, stay here. We want you here because you're going to create jobs. And I think that's the, that's the argument in the heartland and other places that were like, oh, we got, you know, all these immigrants are coming to take our jobs. First of all, like that's not been the case across the board broadly where, where businesses need workers. Um, but uh, in the STEM fields, um, I think it's really important. And then to build that pipeline, I think that's a critical part. Like the one thing that I think is really important for us as a country is to think about these things in a holistic way, in an integrated way. And so from we need we need to dominate the industries of the future. And if I could just take half a step back, because I talked to the kids about this today, and I'm going to call them kids because <laughs> I'm going to be 50. So they're kids um, is that. Is, is having a holistic approach, a whole of government approach. And I think that starts with an understanding that this is a battle of freedom. I'm not talking about a cliche or on the back of a T-shirt on the 4th of July. I'm talking about the United States directly competing with two countries right now, Russia and China, that don't have free press, don't have free speech, ethnic cleansing, no real rule of law in the countries. And we saw what, what, what Russia did in Ukraine and what they continue to do. Same kind of thing. No free elections versus the United States, which is an imperfect country with lots of problems, but yet still maintain free markets, rule of law. Even everything that's happened in the last couple of years are our, our institutions. It was a stress test for sure. But for, you know, proud boys today got convicted of sedition, like they're going to prison, like the, the system is kind of where it's insanity, like it drives us all nuts, but it's kind of working. And that's that's the economic battle that we're talking about here. You have to have a dominant economy um, that is able to project power, because if it's not us, it's them. And if it's them, you have uh, two countries that really aren't interested in peace and stability around the world. So that integrated system of how are we going to have future STEM graduates, how do we get them engaged in grade school? How do we make sure the kids have good nutrition? How do we make sure that we're dealing with their trauma? Like this is all an integrated effort to have a strong economic and, and uh, cultural system here in the United States. And so the easy answer with the immigrants is like, you know, let them come and let's let's play some and let them work for the United States and become Americans. Um, but at the same time, building that comprehensive integrated system pipeline that we talked about. Of course, the other big advantage for the U.S. in attracting immigrants is that it supplements our population. We do have a under replacement birth rate in the U.S. And of course, big news in China that the Chinese population has started declining. Yeah. Uh, what is China planning to do about its talent retention, Damien? Well, are you talking to Damien? I'll take both of you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead, and then I'll follow up. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. It's actually been uh, fairly hard for China to retain its talent. And I think that's been a, a, a sore point for the Chinese government. And uh, they've been trying uh, very hard. And I'll just say, you know, I think it's, you know, we absolutely should have a more integrated, systematic approach. But at the same time, we ought to, uh, you know, 
be cautious and be, and be a little bit concerned about you know having that approach doesn't scare off the very talent that we're trying to to attract and retain. Uh, you know, let me just give you a very concrete example. I think many of you may have heard about this new uh, Chat GPT thing, right? This new AI bot that's gone viral. Well, artificial intelligence is clearly this one domain where U.S. and China are competing uh, significantly. And this is not a competition over financial capital. When it, when it comes to artificial intelligence, it's purely about human capital because it's a very labor-intensive endeavor to train these models, algorithms. It just takes brain power. Now, we've done some study on the top AI talent in the world. And we're not talking about the top 10%. We're not talking about the tw top 25%, but the top 1% AI talent. Um, we, the United States has about 60% of the top 1% AI talent in our country. But the wrinkle to that is that of that 60%, 30% originated from China. Okay, so 30% of our top 1% talent in the United States are, are of Chinese origin. And of that 30%, vast majority of them tend to stay and study and work in US institutions, places probably at OpenAI or Google, where they're working on artificial intelligence. So we want to, you know, we want to be able to uh, have a competitive policy that also keeps in mind that that this is a very labor-intensive, human capital-intensive endeavor, and you know how we frame certain issues can have a chilling effect on the environment overall. So, uh, but but we also, you know, we also need to think about how do we actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, keep uh, keep that competitive, uh, you know, dynamic alive while not also have it's it's a very it's a very delicate balance, I would say. So just to, to add that, um, Asian American Scholars Forum, which is a group that came together during the China Initiative, which was a Trump era Department of Justice led initiative, really focused initially on industrial espionage. So stealing trade secrets when the intended beneficiary is a foreign government, to put my lawyer hat on. And it was because people like Gang Chen, an amazing professor at MIT, were indicted with very serious charges, which were subsequently dropped and essentially seen as, as spies. But they did a study and they went and they surveyed 1,300 STEM field professors of Chinese heritage. And you know, a majority of them felt a chilling effect, and the numbers said that they actually were not getting federal grants anymore and were considering leaving the country. But about 90% said they wanted to contribute to the U.S.'s strength in science and technology. They want to be here. A lot of them move their families here. They don't want to leave. So this is where, and I know this is, goes to the small yard um, high fence, which I didn't really answer, which now I will, <laughs> that you want to figure out what do we really need to protect? What are the sensitive technologies? What is the going to go into the hypersonic missile? What is classified? That is different than fundamental research, studying how like water and air and every, these these elements work, which is something which is open and collaborative and has made the U.S. stronger. So it's going to be hard to figure out what, you know, what is the real things we need to protect and then protect those from any threat, wherever they're coming from, Russia, China, I don't know, Ontario, you know, mm, Bolivia, yes. right? You know, and then protect them well, but to not do it in a way that's feeding bias, xenophobia, and all these things which are essentially going to end up in an own goal for you know, the U.S. Congressman, as you like to say, uh, politics is downstream of culture. How do we avoid creating such a toxic culture? I think really having a focus on the economic piece and the research piece and not so much on which we've had leaders in this country in the past few years that really go at the personal um, approach to this. But we again, we're in this competition, so we've got to be very delicate on how we handle all of this stuff, which again, the culture issues that we have are a recognition of these are very complicated problems. There's no black and white answer to these things, and they take nuance. And if we don't recognize as, as a society that there's nuance to these challenges that we have, you know, we're going to continue to make mistakes. And and that, you know, I talk a lot about like the World War II generation that they've had. They had such deep experiences and connection with each other because of the depression, the challenges, the suffering, then a world war, the challenges, the suffering, the death, the destruction. That generation was really seared and people had traveled the world and fought in this world, world war II, that they understood that life was complicated, that, that these political decisions were very nuanced and that um, 
that there was no easy answer to get out of a depression. There was no easy answer to end a war like the one that, that they were involved in. And now we're suffering in our culture the la that everyone expects like, you know, you're gonna get the answer on your Twitter account with 140 characters. Like, that's not how we're gonna solve these problems. And so, you know, you look at what's going on with China now, just kind of on your last question is with the demographic issue. My opinion, even in the last two or three months since the election is like, China's got a lot of really tough issues that they're gonna be dealing with. You know, there's one working person for every three now retirees. The one, chi uh, the one child policy is really coming home to roost now, um, which is gonna provide a number of challenges for them to deal with. The, the COVID response, Obviously, the protests and all the rest is is dealing with it. They have a huge mortgage back security issue, uh, debt issue that they're dealing with in the mortgage industry. They got some serious, serious challenges that they're facing in the relationship with Russia and energy. Um, so there's an opportunity, I think, for us to reassert ourselves, not that we're 100 percent behind, as Damian mentioned, but there's an opportunity for us to really get into these industries that maybe we're not full fledged in now that we can be in and dominate. And again, this is an issue in my mind of freedom. So I'm imagining that today there's also a parallel panel going on in Beijing where three people and a moderator are discussing how China can catch up to the United States and overcome all of its domestic challenges. Damien, how is China planning to catch up in some of these critical areas? Um, you mean sort of the frontier technology? Yeah, let's talk frontier technologies. Frontier technologies, I mean, uh, obviously uh, they looked at, uh, uh, they, they're looking at what's happening on chips. Uh, clearly they're not happy about it, but I think interestingly, they're, they haven't really retaliated very much, which was what I think people were expecting. But I also think there was, there's not really much leverage on China's side. Um, you know, um, I have a kind of a half, half joking, you know, you know, half joke, which is that China used to have a GDP target. Now they have a target on nanometers. So the smaller the nanometers, the better. That's sort of the new target is, is they got to get the chips. And they know that. And uh, but but I think, you know, um, uh, they're going to be they're going to be ramping up their industrial policy. Uh, and I think that's something we are we are doing as well in the United States with the Chips Act and the IRA. We can go into more of that. Um, how that might affect and distort markets. Um, it's, it's, it's probably the biggest manifestation of economic competition that I've seen in, in quite some time, especially from the United States. Um, and I think you look at the Europeans, it's not just the Chinese, right? Everyone's chasing after the same frontier technologies. And the problem is that the, these supply chains are global. So you can't make the frontier chips without this one company in the Netherlands. Right. You can't make certain things if China doesn't have that particular, uh, you know, widget or input that's really important that nobody has ever even heard of. Right. One example I like to give. We did a big case study. I think the only one on permanent magnets. People don't think a lot about magnets, but every single EV that rolls out off that assembly line has about 10 kilo of magnets in there. China's got about 87 percent of global market share on permanent magnets. Every wind turbine. Every megawatt of wind turbine is 100, or sorry, 800 kilo, kilograms of permanent magnets. We do not have that permanent magnet capacity. So to talk about something that's not a frontier technology per se, but that we need today, how do we sort of ramp up that capacity? And it's not necessarily a China, you know, uh, China's fault or to blame China, just sort of like they've invested in that particular industry and it's there. And so, you know, uh, that's why I think the, you know, the globalization as we know is going to undergo some permutations because one of the main features of the current phase of globalization is basically you should be able to make anything anywhere that makes economic sense. And I think we're kind of moving out of that world a little bit where there's other considerations, other costs about making things and location seems to matter a lot more. But I don't think all, any of us, the United States, China, nor the European Union have really fully figured out or, or understand what that cost might be. Um, because ultimately we're moving from a fairly efficient system to one that is probably going to be less efficient. To a reminder there, this is not just going to be about the U.S. and China. There is a whole other world out there uh, that's going to be dealing with supply chains. The framing of this panel was, you know, the U.S. is finally pushing back on China. Maggie, is anybody else pushing back on China or maybe pushing back on the U.S.? 
Well, I mean, certainly, I mean, that's a that's a huge question. Yes. But one thing that I, I was happy to see with the Biden administration was an emphasis on friends, partners, allies playing nice with others. Um, and I say that as someone, again, who works with human rights. And so the U.S. not being, in, for example, the U.N. Human Rights Council was a huge issue because China will fill that space with its own definition of human rights and say, well, do we really need civil and political rights or can we first have a right to development? And wait, wait a minute here. You know, No, you don't get to put a hierarchy of rights because the reason you need civil and political rights is so you have a free press. So if the schools found, fall down in an earthquake but not the government buildings, you can ask what why is that the case? Was there corruption in the way these were built? So I think that, you know, in general, like this idea now that the U.S. is more out there and working with other countries is hugely important for so many reasons. But, you know, it is complicated because different countries have different interests. And so when we look at, for example, Europe, we recently had a visit to China from um, Germany. And, you know, and there I think that's helpful to try to get some statements like using nuclear weapons is bad. I was happy to see that come out of the visit. Um, you know, even the threat of nuclear weapons is bad. So that's all to say, you don't want to have such a combative relationship that you cannot work together on shared concerns, climate, health, nuclear proliferation. But at the same time, I think it's really important that the U.S. keep reminding its friends, partners, allies, that you they're really, it's hard to walk that line and that they need to be very clear eyed about what are Beijing's goals. So that's what I'm, I'm hopeful for is a really strong conversation and keeping the team together for these really core values. And some of that may be tricky. We've certainly seen uh, some backlash from Europe, from, I was in South Korea a few months ago, they were not thrilled about the restrictions on uh, EV subsidies in the United States. Congressman, when we're looking to strengthen the US and US economics in ways that rely on our allies, how do we thread that needle of getting our allies on board for things that are ultimately subsidies for American workers? Uh, yeah, that's, you know, it's a case by case basis. It, it, again, it's a, these are very, very complicated uh, issues. And we've seen, you know, Europe and European Union be protectionist on on certain issues, too. Um, and so these are just things you got to kind of you got to kind of work out and and kind of massage as you go and give and take on on these particular issues. But I do think, you know, that we have to keep kind of the allies together. The one of the, not that there's been much upside to the war in Ukraine, but it's it's galvanized the West. Um, and hopefully we can we can continue to build on on those relationships that have been strengthened. Um, but there, you know, we're always gonna, for lack of a better term, like piss off Europe about something. You know, there's never gonna, it's never gonna be clean. Um, and, and so, but we have to just remember that we have to maintain our economic strength and we have to make sure that, that, that average people are benefiting from it. I think a lot of the culture issues that we have in the last couple of decades have been economically driven, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of job loss. I represented a district in Youngstown, Ohio. Akron, Ohio, like we saw thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs leave to go to Mexico, to go to China. Then automation came in on top of globalization. And so there's a lot of anxiety there. So I don't think we should apologize for saying we want to dominate the industries of the future and we want to make sure that we have a robust middle class for people who that are working hard and doing everything right. And, you know, you're going to have those the geopolitical tiffs that are that are happening a lot and they will continue to happen but we got to work through it because we have more in common than not these are the these are the states built on freedom and so we have a we have shared values at a very very deep level of course one of the complicating things about being a free market economic system is that our companies have the freedom to choose to invest where they think it makes the most economic sense and a lot of us china economic integration wasn't done by U.S. government fiat. It was done because companies decided yeah. it was a good marketplace to invest in. So, I mean, Damon, you know all about how deeply intertwined the U.S. and China are economically. Do you think we're going to see real decoupling from any of these major companies? Every time someone brings up the term decoupling, it's, it's it kind of... Uh, I know, I saw your hair. I'm not sure how to respond or react to that particular term because it's quite a vague term. Um, I would say that... Um, um, 
it is absolutely true, as I said earlier, that this current phase of globalization was driven predominantly by the last 40 years of US-China integration, um, um, which had very large spillover effects globally. So to the extent that this particular interdependence is becoming less interdependent, that's obviously going to disrupt the current paradigm to some extent. Um, but I also think uh, it's, it's, it's a very slow moving and probably uh, currently a fairly overhyped uh, you know, narrative. I think a lot of things are narrative driven, but if you look at the data, if you look at what's actually happening on the ground, um, you know, there's been a lot of anecdotes about some companies leaving to go to Southeast Asia. Vietnam gets a little bit of it, but, but what they're not saying is that a lot of those companies are actually just Chinese companies mm. leaving because they also want to have you know uh, cheaper labor costs in Southeast Asia. Um, but you know, if you listen to you know a lot of the companies, is that China has developed over the last 30 years, this is again to my deploying the present point, is that they've built a manufacturing ecosystem that's really second to none um, in this geographic area that's mostly in southern China, about 100 and 130 million people. Right? The way I think about that area is it's basically sort of, it's about the size of Mexico population-wise. And that, 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 that whole particular manufacturing ecosystem uh, is extremely robust, it's very efficient. Um, you know, if you think about ecosystems, how many people here really love switching from iOS to Android? We don't even like doing that, right? We're like, no, we're going to stick with the iOS because it works. It's so great. It's efficient because everything works. And that's what Apple does to put you in there and Android too. They're, everyone's competing on the ecosystem. So the ecosystem system effect is extremely hard to replicate. You can get a few things here, but then how do you build, build up that ecosystem, you know, Back in the day, the Midwest was, of course, at the auto ecosystem. So now, can we rebuild, kind of have that EV ecosystem here in the Midwest and you know maybe the U.S. South? That's really the competition. It's not about taking a piece, one piece of the supply chain, and putting it here. That's easy, right? So the efficiency gains you get from sort of that China ecosystem is very, 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 uh, you know, uh, it's very difficult to replicate. And so that's something we have to think a little bit more holistically about, sort of, you know. Um, if we're going to go the, go down the industrial policy route, can we sustain that for 20 years through different administrations? And so, I, I, you know, it, it's it's not an easy it's not an easy question. Like 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 the congressman said, it's it's a very you have to think a bit more long term and, and can you sustain that political will if we're going to go down that route? Because that's what China had to do for it, for an entire generation. And it, it's it's clearly more difficult here in the United States. Like soup to nuts. Like it's more difficult. You know, one to have a, a comprehensive industrial policy that is supported in a bipartisan way, and the way it needs to be would, in my mind, would be like the Cold War policy. Like we had a policy against the Soviet Union from World War II until the wall fell that was carried by Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, right, Bush, right to the end bipartisan. Um, that was the American policy. And I think when we think about industrial policy, it's got to have that same kind of integration between the political parties. And, and, and that's how you sustain it. And it's obviously more difficult because we have this sloppy, messy thing called a republic that we're trying to keep together here um, and integrate, you know, millions of people that speak different languages and different cultures and the politics and the media and the social media. And so that's the challenge, too. And then you get into like, I need a permit and there's a wetland. And I got to go through the Chicago City Council. Mm. Like, oh boy, you know, and then a team of lawyers come in or we, you know, we want to build this facility and the CHIPS Act, like that was like in the middle of like trying, it was like, this is so straightforward. We need industrial policy. We need to help these companies. And we landed Intel in Ohio that's locating right outside of Columbus. It's going to be a hundreds of billions of dollars. It's 7,000 union construction people to build the facility, you know, for years, and then 5,000 union construction workers for the next 10 years, 3,000 workers in the factory, the fab. The average wage is going to be like $150,000 a year in Ohio. It's like, you know, we're not much different than, you know, Chicago, but, but that's huge. 
And like, but it took like moving heaven and earth to be able to do that. And now, now they're trying to build it out and they got to deal with the local governments. And it's just like in China, it's like, uh, we're building a factory here. Here's 50 bucks. You're out. You got two weeks, pack it up and off they go to, to build it. And there it's that that's easier. But then at the same time, that same mindset is like the one COVID policy. Like we're going to, we're going to like weld you into your apartment because we don't want you to leave. Right. And, and so that's the same mindset. So our free society gives us so many advantages, including, you know, people wanting to come do research and development here. People want to live here, freedom to, you know, access the free markets, do the research, which is our comparative advantage. So it's, again, it's complicated, but it's, it's complicated from United States Congress trying to pass the CHIPS Act down to trying to get a local permit and having to deal with the local government. That, that's, those are the challenges we have. But, but I think, too, it's kind of this Goldilocks problem where we, we, we want enough industrial policy that it's not just a hot mess, right? But we don't want so much that it's going to squelch the creativity, right? We're at this amazing university and smart people hanging out with other smart people and thinking creatively and not having too much policy and here putting blinders on is what comes up with the big breakthroughs. And thinking too about the, you know, not just in defense of lawyers, but you know, and that you're you, at heart, or you still consider yourself a lawyer? So not at all. In there. Okay. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's worse, lawyer or congressman. I, don't, <laughs> I have to figure that out. But, you know, I was in China, it must have been about four years ago with a group of congressional staffers from the home offices of across the U.S. And so they dealt, you know, day to day with the local constituents. And we were in in, uh, Xiamen, and um, they had just recently built this new tunnel, and it had cut travel time, you know, in just you know miraculously, and it built this tunnel in Xiamen. It's near the coastal um, side of um, China, and and in some ways, the group I was with, who most had never been to China, were just in awe that like in six months this tunnel was built and made, and on the other hand, they were horrified because they're thinking. Well, who lived here and did they have any notice and comment? Of course not, right? So how do you get rid of the worst of the bureaucracy that's an anchor and weighing us down while still making sure that you keep the notice and comment period, that you keep that sense of hearing from the affected communities so we don't get the excesses of locking people into their apartments in a way that's so draconian. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, again, it's nuanced and that's hard. Yeah, and that's, you know, like just talking to the students here, like that's the kind of culture shift that we need because, you know, you kind of need to do both. You need to build this stuff, but you also need to respect the the views of people that are, you know, going to be, uh, you know, going to be affected by it. And and that's a complicated thing for us to ask, but it's like it's where we have to be because we want to protect those freedoms. We want people to have a voice, but we've got to move the economy forward. And that's why the Democrat Republican food fight about really, really dumb shit is really bad because, you know, like I said, you turn on, turn on the TV and it's like Dr. Seuss and like, and go, you know, and I would see, you know, I'd sit in these hearings and sit in the defense program and like, look at what China's doing. And, and then you go back and you turn on TV and it's a fight about, you know, Dr. Seuss and SpongeBob and M&Ms. You know, I don't even know what to say. You know, it's like that's that's why we've got to get our act together. And I think anybody that cares about the future of the country, um, we have to we have to resolve this political gridlock that we have here now. I wish us good luck in resolving that political gridlock. <laughs> it seems a little bit inherent to the system sometimes. I want to go back to our our parallel panel in Beijing that's having this discussion. You know, China has just watched the U.S try to kneecap its semiconductor industry, uh, make a huge pivot to industrial policies and all the technologies that it wants to get into, and is watching a bunch of US allies think about doing the same thing. How is China, you've said they haven't responded yet. Damien, do you have a sense of how they're planning to respond? Is it just a matter of shoring up their own industries? What I see right now is China's working very hard on Europe, right? I mean, that, that seems like an obvious strategic choice. Uh, I think Maggie mentioned Germany. That's obviously uh, a big country uh, that, that, that tends to drive a lot of, uh, you know, European policy. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the road to Brussels for Beijing was always through Berlin for a long time. And, and I think it essentially continues to, to be that. Um, now, Europe, again, 
the supply chain itself is, 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 is quite distributed. So, you know, Europe doesn't have all of it. Um, but I think, you know, if they can cobble together a few pieces, and that's a little bit heavily uh, domestically, maybe, uh, you know, uh, 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 get some of that reverse brain drain, but possibly. Uh, they're trying hard, but not sure that's really successful. Um, but, um, but, but also, you know, will they get that frontier chip? Will they all, you know, will they be ahead of TSMC? That's, you know, nobody knows for sure. But I would say they also are, are not just focusing on those chips. They're also focusing on these sort of middle range chips that are, again, have huge market demand today. Uh, if you think about, again, we talk a lot about the electric vehicle, but that's the most, you know, disruptive transformative industry we see right now in transport, uh, you know, and everyone's chasing after it. If you think about that vehicle in 2030, uh, assuming current trend sold is essentially going to be a computer on wheels. So everything that goes into your iPhone is also going to be inside that going to be inside that car. So the supply chain is going to be basically the iPhone supply chain plus the car supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. And some batteries. And that's what that, that's what we're talking about. But there's way more chips in there than just sort of these leading frontier edge chips. And you only need that frontier chip because you want to do autonomous driving. But if you don't. You know, there. You know, I, I can't say the exact number, but there are hundreds of chips in there, and China could carve out a couple couple areas where they could still dominate those that are not maybe in, in the leading edge, and then the idea is that they could use that revenue, pump it furthermore into R and D, and then hopefully eventually in ten years, fifteen years, they can they can sort of reach parity. Now, it's again, it's very very hard. Right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, it, it's 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 almost like a fluke that TSMC happened. The way it did, and, and Intel, and, and so on. So, there's no no guarantees, but I think they're trying to find find ways around it. And you know, in the in the in the interim, they're really focusing on not you know developing uh, sort of these mid range technologies that are going to have a lot of big you know huge market share, but that are probably not as technologically sensitive as sort of the frontier chips. I, I think the, the the Biden administration really is. I think they're. They're succeeding at, at trying to kneecap uh, China with when it regard to the high end chips and the mid level chips, and China can still kind of do the the low level chips that are more like the Internet of Things kind of uh, uh, chip manufacturing. But they're limiting even their ability to like get machines to make those kind of things, and it's it's a pretty pretty big move. Um, I know China, China was really not happy about it. Um, but you know, I think it's when you when you look what their end goals are, like we have to exercise some some authority on this. And you know, kind of to your question, the the long term raw material contracts in Africa, are, I think like their their strategy to like try to galvanize these industries and really you know be able to have the rare earths that they need. Um, and that's something that our military and defense really need to continue to try to think about, like, how are we going to get this stuff? And again, a lot of this is research and development. How do you recycle some of these materials? Like, that's where the United States, I think, can play a play a really key role is, is like figuring it out. That's what we do. We invent, we innovate, we figure out how to do it. And the materials revolution is like ripe for some breakthroughs. And we just got to, you know, continue to put some money behind it. And that's, that's why, like, the, the whole anti-government sentiment that's out there, and you're seeing it now with, like, the debt ceiling. And I'm not saying that, that the government needs doesn't need to work more efficiently, like the Defense Department, the procurement. It's a nightmare. Um, but we do have to make investments in the next generation of things. It's the only that's our, that's our advantage. We come up with the new ways of doing things. And there's a materials revolution there. There's a, there's a vehicle revolution there. There's an energy revolution there. It's, it's everywhere, you know, AI, um, biotech. Like, we've got to be the country that's just leading on all that stuff. You know, we've talked a lot about, you know, so the physical supply chain. We've talked about the talent supply chains. We haven't talked yet about investment, uh, which is the other big thing linking the U.S. and China, is huge flows of foreign direct investment between the two countries. Um, do we see changes on the horizon for how the U.S. treats Chinese investment? Is it going to start discriminating against Chinese investors? Is China being more cautious about taking American FDI? You're the 
private sector guy. Uh, well, data data suggests that there's actually been uh, there's actually been a, a slight uptick in Chinese investment. Not really in the uh, I'm, I'm talking about Chinese uh, direct investment. So so we're about to publish some data, uh, hopefully fairly soon. In fact, Ohio saw 11 percent increase in uh, Chinese direct investment uh, from 2017 to 2021. Um, but uh, I would say the high watermark for, you know, sort of a really aggressive Chinese investment probably peaked around 2016. And it's been it's been going down ever since, but doesn't mean it's completely dried up. And I think, uh, you know, the political environment has a lot to do with it. Um, but I also think that, um, again, going back to which part of the supply chain do we really need that we cannot get in the next five to seven years? And when you think about, you know, is that, you know, does that mean uh, Chinese direct investment in that particular segment is a solution that we need to think think a little bit more about rather than just saying we can't have Chinese investment across all these things. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and again, this takes sort of a, a, literally, I think, going down and coming up with a list of like, this is okay, that's not okay, this is what we need, this is what we not need. For example, I mentioned magnets. Uh, you know, the Commerce Department had been investigating into it because uh, I think our government didn't have a sense of what the what the situation was about magnets. And then they I think Commerce announced that they were not going to impose tariffs on Chinese magnets, because, again, I think this was one area, one area where we just simply couldn't get the capacity up. Right. And I think we need to, again, think a little bit more about if we fully exclude China out of out of you know these supply chains, whether it's going to have an inflationary impact on a lot of these products. Because right now, the electric vehicle is not cheap, right? It's more expensive than a gasoline vehicle. So if we really want rapid adoption, which would drive industry, which would drive companies like Ford and GM to, to, you know, to, to make their investment worth it, we need to think about, OK, do we, wanna, do we want a $45,000 EV to be even more expensive? Because we're cutting, you know, some, you know, we're cutting certain supply chains out of it. Um, that's actually, that actually doesn't make a lot of economic sense. Because at the end of the day, this is an economic story. This is an economic development that's going to take, uh, and for, for, for consumers to get it, you're going to want to have, you got, you got to have the battery to, to be at price parity with a gasoline car. That's the only way to get that car to be the same price, to be at you know, $25,000 or whatever a gasoline car costs this year. But uh, that's, going to take, that's going to take quite a while, and that's going to take efficiency, scale, so um, we can build from scratch, but to get to that scale is going to take a long time. And just, you know, that it's it's not new to have oversight of foreign investment in the U.S. We've long had CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., that was then upgraded with FIRMA. And, but I think there, you know, it's really about needing to have people in the conversation who understand the technology behind it, you know, what should we really be concerned about, understand the way these investment vehicles are set up, and, you know, because you can have a lot of different ways to get money into the U.S., that it's a very complicated, sophisticated question. And so sometimes I worry that we aren't sort of getting all the people together in this conversation that really need to be a part of it, because it is something where, you know, the conversation five years ago would have been different than it is today about what technologies we're concerned about. And even things like TikTok, which I think it's really good that we're scrutinizing how, you know, that could affect us. But I'm honestly more concerned about it melting my kids' brains and making them feel terrible about themselves than about national security. So I also don't want sort of the, the, the things that are getting the you know, eyeball grabbing headlines to take so much focus and things like magnets, which I don't think are getting attention, are not really in the forefront. So being, again, thinking about what are the real concerns and then putting our energy towards those. I, I think it's, I, I think Damien's right. I mean, I, I do think that, that China's going to have a rough go here the next few years. And so I think it's going to be very difficult for them to make the foreign investments that they would they would probably ideally like to make. I mean, um, their 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 GDP growth was at three percent. Most analysts are saying that they're lying. Um, that they've that's probably much worse than that. Um, same with the population numbers. They were saying you know how the birth rate numbers are are super low and that. They published them, so they're probably not true. They're probably worse than the ones they they put out there. Um, and well, so it, it's a shrinking for the first time ever. Right. The overall population is now shrinking. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, to me, 
I don't know. I think they're going to really be, the president's going to be really concerned about his own political standing. You know, we saw how they kind of backpedal a little bit with the riots. I, I think they're going to be very focused on what's going on in China. So we are going to move to Q&A in uh, four minutes here, but I do want to get one last question in. We touched on TSMC earlier and how it's making big investments in the U.S., partly driven by the U.S. demanding it. How is this being seen in Taiwan? Uh, the idea that we are going to rely so heavily on you for semiconductors. So I, I spent most of the pandemic in Taiwan, and then I was just back for a week in December, and I was down in, in Shinju, which is the, you know, the tech hub. And and there were conversations with people who are not in the tech industry, but even this, the, the zeitgeist was we're, we, we've seen people move, and they're moving to Arizona, and, and they're leaving. And in some ways, you hear about sort of the Silicon Shield, that it's going to protect Taiwan, that it has that high tech that the U.S. wants to protect but at the same time, it's vulner more vulnerable if that stops that starts to be reshored to the U.S. So I think there's mixed feelings because, of course, Taiwan is is hugely reliant on U.S. support, um, and we have more conversations today than I've ever heard in my lifetime about what nature of U.S. support Taiwan should be beyond just sort of continuing arms sales, but also what those arms sales should be. So I think, I think there's a real mixed views. And Taiwan is, uh, it's an overused phrase, but it is a vibrant democracy. It has a presidential election coming up and will have a new president because President Tsai is termed out, so she can't run again. So I think it's going to be a really interesting year in the run-up to that. It's unclear, but starting to take shape who the main contenders are. Um, and, and the U.S. and foreign policy towards the U.S. and also cross-strait relations are, of course, going to be a key part of all of that. Got to love a good, messy democracy. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, we might have uh, Kevin McCarthy visiting Taiwan potentially this year. And of course, Taiwan is heavily reliant on China for its trade. It puts everyone in a very interesting position. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think again, this could be a consistent a point of consistency. Um, when Speaker Pelosi went, McCarthy's going. Democratic president is putting on these um, sanctions and around the semiconductor industry. Clearly, the Republican Party started a committee in Congress to. You know, analyze and talk about uh, a, more, a more comprehensive China strategy. So it could be, you know, a point of of consistency in this messy democracy that we have. I would just add one final point, which is I think to the TSMC example. I think if if we could sort of frame this, you know, uh, the idea of thinking about economic competition and supply chains, whether it's TSMC, if we sort of just take the China thing out of it. I think objectively speaking, whether it's TMC or any other any other company, it's probably not the smartest to have 70% of your high-end chips made out of one company, right? Or to have 80% of something made out of one country. I mean, I think in general, China or not China, Taiwan or not China, China United States or not. So I think if we can frame it around sort of like there, there's maybe a holistic assessment of sort of how do we diversify just to build a little bit more resilience, China or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's what we need to think about because I think the framing of sort of this is always against China or not makes it quite problematic because China, you know, uh, in reality has a lot of it. But, you know, but again, there's no reason that one company should have 70% of market share on high end, high end chips. And I don't think anybody has really, uh, really understands how that even happened. But it, but it is the reality, so we got to deal with it. But if we can frame it around sort of diversification, building more resilience around the world, uh, I, that I think uh, it might be a better sell than, than, than how it's being framed currently. All right, I see a lot of people standing on microphones, uh, which is a great sign. So uh, I'm going to go right and then left. We'll just alternate. If you could please introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you all for being here. My name is RJ. I'm a third year in the college studying economics and political science. Um, the, congressman, the congressman mentioned that the U.S. should aim to dominate the industries of the future. And given that the U.S. and China are some of the world's largest uh, polluters at the moment, those industries are probably going to be revolving around or relying on green energy, sustainable development, sustainable technology. So if the U.S. finally decides to really commit to those industries, do you think China will follow or will it double down on fossil fuel industries and fill that vacuum that the U.S. would leave? Um, 
That's a great question. I mean, I think they're going into some of these industries hard because there's economic development there. I'm not saying it's necessarily a climate value on their part. So I think they'll continue to make those investments because there's opportunity for growth there for them. They see it, you know, wind is growing at 15, 20, 25 percent. So is solar, like the electric vehicles, they want to be in on all that. So I think they'll continue to do it. Um, the, the concern in Asia, the concern in China is really the, the use of coal. Um, and in one way, and even in Europe now, Germany has the, for the last two years, they have the highest coal usage that they've had in years. They got rid of nuclear and it's like reverting back. And so I think the opportunity for the United States is in the natural gas industry. I think, you know, we have a comprehensive plan. Uh, if we have a comprehensive plan where we can, the, the, the number one country that reduced CO2 from 2005 to 2019 was the United States because of our shift to natural gas from coal. I think that same strategy can be deployed around the world and we can export our natural gas as part of a 30, 40 year plan, get you know, a, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, like all of these countries have a significant coal uh, aspect of their portfolio, their energy portfolio. So for us to be able to get this gas out of here, get it to Europe, get it to Asia, we can see a 50 to 60% reduction in CO2 in the next however many years, which would be huge as we are moving into wind, solar, and these other things. So I'm hope, my hope is that even though they're going in on that in China and we're going in on it here with the CHIPS Act and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, that natural gas becomes a huge component of like the global strategy in the short term as a part of that portfolio. But aren't they going to take away our natural gas stoves or something like that? Wasn't that, <laughs> wasn't that the uh, yeah. latest? Uh, yeah, there you have it. Thank you. I hope not. <laughs> we'll go left side. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Christopher Phillips. I'm a second year at the college. I would just really like to know more about uh, all three of your positions or policies or beliefs on restricting uh, Chinese purchases of farmland in our country. Uh, you think that's probably beneficial, something we need to do? You think we should be hands off on that? I want to know what you think about that. Um, yeah, I do think we should. I do think we should. I think, you know, the food, the food issue is um, an important issue. I think it's a national security issue. I mean, clearly it needs to be limited and I think we need to put up some some red flags. Um, doesn't mean it can't you know happen from time to time. But I think what you're seeing um, is, again, like this is a, a country that, you know, wants to figure out how to undermine the United States economically. And so we have to be very, very careful. And I think farmland is is a potentially one of those critical issues. I don't have any strong views on that particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name is Benjamin Cortez. Uh, I'm a first year at the college. Uh, and uh, the overriding theme for this discussion, and in fact, most of the media, is that we are competing with China. Um, do you think that there's any areas that perhaps we can cooperate with China? I hope there are. I mean, we just came, we're coming out of, I don't want to say it's in the rear view mirror of a pandemic, right? And so this is a time that I think, you know, we should all be really realizing too, that it's not probably going to be the last pandemic in at least some people's lifetimes, you know, than in, in this room, right? We hope it'll be a long ways until the next one. So I think we need to, we need to on climate, we need to on, 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 on health. And, and these are the things though, too, where I love that there's so many college students here. So I first went to China in 1995 when I was in college. And um, and I'm really sad that there's not the movement of students, not just as many coming from China to the US, but from the US to China. Because if we are gonna cooperate, we need the people to people relations. And I, I, I was so sad when the Fulbright to China stopped. And I was a Fulbrighter with Taiwan. Um, and I know there's some security concerns, but I think a lot of those can be worked through because the basis of cooperation on any of these issues is 
people to people relations. And so right now, I think that we need to put much more energy into getting that fabric reestablished. And so hopefully we can not just compete, but have aspects that do have cooperation. It's, it's gotta be mutually beneficial. I mean, that's, you know, when you, people operate in their own interests. And, and so wherever those interests align, which I think energy could be, a, you know, could be a, an opportunity. I don't know. Like you'd have to, I'm sure there's a lot of diplomats and economists that could tell us exactly where those alignments would be. Um, but, you know, they're going to be much different than they were 30 or 40 years ago when there was the investment into China where the global supply chain was going to be integrated. And so it was like everybody can kind of benefit from that. Now that, that the global order is kind of unraveling a little bit, which is kind of a historic thing happening here, like there's going to have to be some thought to that. I don't know off the top of my head what that would be, but I would think energy would be and some of these newer industries may be opportunities for us to do that. I would just say that the uh, the issue isn't that there aren't areas to collaborate. There are plenty. Um, I can identify, could go down a list of three or four. I mean, these there are. You know, we just went through a pandemic. Uh, we you know we, we have sort of a slow moving climate change crisis, or perhaps fast moving, depending on how you uh, how you uh, you know how you define it. So there are a, a number of issues. I think the key is whether you know uh, how do we make how do we make sort of the global institutions that uh, that's going to have to accommodate a China in the United States. The G7 and the G77. Uh, you know, um, you know. Um, unfortunately, we didn't. Uh, it wasn't the best demonstration of collective action during the pandemic. And so, I think part of this thinking, and not just defining areas of collaboration. I think that's fairly obvious. It's just sort of how do we, uh, you know, adapt to global institutions? How do we get U.S. and China to to, to kind of uh, perhaps not lead, but to certainly take leadership roles within those institutions that they can both agree on, and then actually tackle some of these. You might call them common humanity problems that are bigger than any singular country. Um, so again, I think it's an institutional and political problem rather than can we have places we can cooperate on. And in some extent, legal. Like there's, you know, the the intellectual property issue is real. They, we have intellectual property rights in the United States. They see those rights as com communal or part of the country. So they, you know, they've stolen intellectual property for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, from United States companies. So I think that's part of why you're seeing a lot of the companies come back to the United States is that there's a fatigue there of like trying to, you're stealing your stuff, <laughs> you know? So to, to find those uh, levels of alignment and agreement is cool, but like a company's gonna be like, yeah, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna work with the Chinese government because they steal my stuff. So that's, that's a big hurdle for us to have to get over. I'll also just chime in and say that we no longer have a consistent process for engaging China on a lot of issues. The strategic and economic dialogue was abandoned, uh, heavily modified and then abandoned during the Trump administration, and there's been no effort to revive it. So there is also a, a serious process problem. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Debbie Marothra. Um, I'm a second year in the college. I'm actually one of Representative Ryan's um, fellows ambassadors um, for the two or three days that he's here. Um, so my question is actually about a few actors in Asia that I think we haven't gotten the chance to touch on. Um, considering that the CHIPS Act inv involved tens of billions of dollars of investment from South Korea's SK Group um, and on the semiconductor issue and in terms of um, techno technological investment in the United States, how do South Korea and Japan fit into this conversation? Uh, they're two very important economic actors in the region. How, like, how do you see them continuing to play a role both in US strategy, but also in China's perception of the region, economically and militarily? I know it's a lot. <laughs> I'll take the Japan side if someone takes Korea. I can try to take Korea. Sure. But what, what do you want to go well, first? Just, I mean, again, you know, okay. I, I, we just had a Kashida's visit. And I, I think that I, the U.S. Japan relationship is stronger than ever. Um, again, my perspective is someone who spends a lot of time looking and working on Taiwan issues that I've never heard the Japanese government be so vocal in support of peace and security in the Taiwan Strait. 
a lot of concerns um, amongst not just the government, but the population of the citizenry in Japan. Um, but of course, they've got huge threats from North Korea, but um, a military, uh, an increase in their military capacity is not just about concerns about North Korea. Uh, and so I'd say from the military side um, that I, I think it's, it's good to see that uh, Japan is taking seriously um, their security position and their vulnerabilities. Um, and this is something that obviously the Biden administration is very aware of and working very hard on. Well, on South Korea, uh, being an ally, so is Japan, uh, being an ally of the United States, uh, South Korea is clearly part of the U.S. ally-based economic strategy. Uh, especially when it comes to EV supply chains or even chips, because if you look at the industries in which South Korea has a comparative a comparative on a managing, it's it's cars, batteries, and chips. Um, but the issue, I think, it was something we brought up in the conversation, is that how does our pursuit of industrial policy, uh, in many ways, could potentially undermine that ally-based strategy? Because if we want them to participate in our supply chain then you know uh, uh, some of those countries can, could potentially view the way we're pursuing industrial policy as somewhat protectionist and therefore not market access for their products. And so it becomes, uh, it becomes a bit contradictory. And so I think we need to think a little bit harder about if we want allies to participate in our economic strategy, then how do we come up with uh, an approach that, that, that kind of compromises on, on certain aspects? And we're seeing a little bit of that with sort of the compromise on the uh, on the Inflation Reduction Act, which is all about energy and, uh, and and the clean tech, but I think this is a this is a thorny knot that we need to untie a little bit because uh, because I think it's clear what we want to do, but it's just are we pursuing competing goals, especially when it comes to South Korea? And I do think that, that again there are opportunities here. Um, we have a battery plant in, in Youngstown, just outside of the an old General Motors facility, uh, Ultima Cells, which is, a, which is a General Motors and South Korean LG Chem partnership happening. So I do think like for us to like cut these guys in on the deal, our allies around the world to cut them in on the industrial policy here in the United States, I think is, is really entirely proper for us to do that. We, you know, living in a in a shrunken world, even though the current version of globalization seems to be kind of unraveling a little bit, I think there's opportunities for us, for our allies to partner here uh, in the United States and creating jobs. I think they're just unionized. So, you know, there's gonna be pretty good wages there. Um, that That's really important. The Inflation Reduction Act is another opportunity, um, you know, for, for us to do that. But, and then getting back to the, the natural gas piece, it's a, South Korea, Japan, like again, we can we can continue to deepen. And a lot of the Trans-Pacific Partnership countries that we were talking about, you know, are these are these Asian countries going to go to China or are they going to come to the United States? And so when President Obama was trying to get past the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that was the idea. They're going to go to China, they're going to come to us. And how do we deepen our economic ties? Well, I don't think a trade agreement at this point is doable at all. I do think like get, getting them connected to us through our natural gas and these different other ventures here in the United States could be, you know, could be a great way for us to continue to build momentum. Hello, I'm Kenneth Sias. I'm a first year in the college. I would like to ask the members of the panel their thoughts as to how the large population capacity of China plays a role into the US economy's response to the Chinese. Can you clarify? Can you clarify your question a little bit? I'm sorry. I mean that China, especially, has a population of over a billion people, and yeah. the U.S. population is 300 million. How does that play in the future, in the long term, of the U.S. and Chinese economy? Uh, well, China is going to have a lower per capita GDP than us for a really long time, and uh, so, so you know, China. I, I think, I, as I talked about earlier, uh, they 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 had their first uh, population shrinking not just smaller growth, but literally shrinking. So they, they're they having fewer people now uh, for the first time. I think that was the number out of 20, 2021 or 2022. Um, so, you know, to, to think about to think about it this way, if China were serious about reaching absolute parity with the U.S. economy, 
they need to be four times the size of the U.S. Uh, you know, economy to, to, to reach that per capita level. So that's not realistic in any conceivable future. Uh, the best they can do is probably reach something somewhere close to Taiwan, which is about $24,000, $25,000 per capita GDP. And that's really their uh, medium term goal, right? They set a goal from now until 2035. They basically want to double their GDP to about 30 trillion. And by, that would allow them to have about a $25,000 per capita GDP. So, um, but the US is close to 60. So that's, you know, it, it's, you know they, they, they might become the world's biggest economy. And I think when that day happens, I don't know how the US might react. I don't know what the New York Times headline will say, but realistically, they're still going to be, you know, uh, less than half of U.S. per capita GDP. Yeah, and and with the you know, shrinking population, which of course is going to have huge issues with the demographic pyramid. I mean, Taiwan, thinking of it, I mean, its demographic pyramid is inverted, and and that puts you know huge pressures on on the people that are younger in society. Um, but also, I just want to point out that as this shift towards um, a lowering the birth rate is so low in China that it's putting also a lot of pressure on women. Um, and and a lot of you know societal pressure and government pressure um, to have more children and so this is an economic issue it's a yeah. demographic issue and it is also an issue about you know how to make sure that all members of society feel that they can succeed and be encouraged to be out there in the workforce um, and not start having more pressure to also be you know this mother role that maybe some women are very excited to have the government endorsing that more but it also can create pressures on those who don't want that. So that's another facet of this conversation. You know, like everything cuts both ways. So they have more people, they're graduating more STEM graduates than we are by, you know, two, three times, I think. But they have, as Damien was saying, they have one worker for every three people that are retiring. They have five to 10 million people moving out of the, the uh, you know, business world, work world into retirement. That's a significant problem, you know, um, on top of the mortgage issue and the debt issue and the other things that they have going on. And I do think it's a, it's an opportunity for us as 330 million people to recognize, like, again, getting back to the why we need to do the things like, like invest into the workforce, invest into health, invest into education, invest in the lifting people out of poverty because we only have 330 million people and they have 1.4 billion and we're competing with the world. So we need to have everybody on the field playing for us in the United States with the Team USA jersey on. And that means you can't have half the population with diabetes or prediabetes. Right? You can't have you know inadequate schools. You can't have you know, uh, unhealthy communities and neighborhoods. You can't have lead, you know, lead poisoning at significantly high levels in a lot of these neighborhoods. So just uh, my personal thing is I just want pe people in the country to see like this is a very stiff competition and there is a why to the public investments that we have to make. It's not just, oh, a bunch of Democrats want to spend a bunch of money. It's like, no, we have to spend it wisely and in an innovative way, but to plug all 330 million people in so we can win the ultimate competition that we're in. We've got about three minutes left. Try to make it quick. Um, hi, my name is Kate. I'm a second year in the college. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about the Chinese's Belt and Road Initiative, particularly their practice of debt trapping developing countries by giving them promises of infrastructure and energy projects and then um, not giving an avenue for them to necessarily pay back their debts and then ex like thereafter extending their political autonomy within these nations. I'm just wondering what the U.S. can do to safeguard developing nations from the practice of debt trapping and also how and are, you know, or how and is the U.S. a competitive um, alternative when, you know, like, you know, can we can, can we compete? Can we provide like our own version of the Belt and Road Initiative that doesn't have these, co co you know, these dangerous practices? Damon, you want to talk BRI? Um, I'll just make two very quick points. Uh, I think uh, the debt trap narrative uh, has been uh, overhyped considerably. Uh, there's really been one or two examples, and, and for the most part, China has started to try to forgive some of those loans and in some ways uh, delay those loans. Um, I think we have to remember that this is really China's first foray into international development. Uh, and I think what you're seeing now is that they're actually curtailing their ambitions pretty dramatically. 
And I think like every country, like the United States before, like European, like Europe before, they're learning how difficult it is to actually do international development. Uh, you spend a lot of money. It's not clear what the end goal is. Is it political? Is it soft power? Is it just building roads and bridges? So if you're looking at the numbers, um, BRI, you know, outbound investment basically peaked around 2017. It, it's basically plummeted uh, in, in, in the last few years through the pandemic. So I think China is actually having an internal big reassessment about how they actually approach that. And I think uh, I think there's a lot of you know uh, critiques internally about you know wh wh you know are you spending your money wisely? And I think similar to our you know to to, to the congressman's point, like why invest in other countries when we need to invest in China? Right. That's a that that's a very similar argument that's happening in China right now. I'm happy to take one more question. Oh, sure. We'll get one more quick in there. Yep. Um, hi, my name is Anna Geddes. I'm a second year in the college. Um, my question is with regards to the increase in China's Chinese activities in Africa and what that means for the U.S. specifically in long term about like import of primary products and just overall, like more information on that. Raw materials, think, right? Yeah, I think, that raw, you know, obviously raw material, they're signing long-term raw material contracts in these African nations. I think we just touched upon some of the, the debt trap stuff. Um, but I think there's, there's lots of opportunity, I think, for the United States when we look at these alternative sources of energy, um, whether it's natural gas or renewables, uh, in Africa. And I think it, it, it's got to be a broader conversation, almost like Marshall Plan style uh, investments in some of these countries to help them gear up and be able to, you know, tap into the sun, tap into wind, tap into these renewable forms, help them with the grid. I mean, th these are the kind of things that, that I think the United States needs to do to continue to build goodwill around the world. And, and, that, and clearly China was trying to do that um, and now isn't, um, but you know, foreign aid invest, private investment into Africa around these new technologies, I think could be a real winner for everybody. And this isn't just an economic issue. It's a human rights issue. I mean, think back a decade or so ago when Human Rights Watch wrote a great report about Chinese investment in Zambian copper mines and, and the labor abuses that were occurring. So I think, too, you know, we, we really, the U.S. has an opportunity here, not just economically, but again, to show that there can be a model um, to go out and, and to invest in a way that is making those communities stronger and not in just an exploitive way, um, but in, in a way that's going to build that U.S. soft power, which we need um, for, you know, for really making sure that the U.S. carries with it moral weight and authority. All right. We are two minutes over time. If you did not get your question answered, uh, come up afterwards. I think some folks might stick around. Everyone else, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Great to do an yeah, in-person event with y'all. Thank you. Awesome. Great job, man.